بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم who came with the teachings of all of the Anbiya whereby three elements is what all of the prophets that they came with. They came with al-akhlaq, fine character and behavior, which is unanimous amongst the Anbiya, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second thing that we find that they came with is al-ahkam, rules and regulations. Slight variances in what their rules and regulations may be, but they all came with regulations to be followed upon this earth. And more importantly, before that, we find the first teaching that every single prophet came with is ilm tawheed The knowledge of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Quran mentions, at Surah Al-Nahl, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولَ أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Indeed, we did send amongst every single nation a messenger calling and telling his people to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from al-taghut whatever is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that should be the life of the believer, the Muslim, of returning back to calling only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most important knowledge for the believer upon this earth is a belief regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus you find the Qur'an mentioned, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَالْمَلَائِكَ وَأُلُوا الْعِلْمِ قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمِ The beginning of Surah Al-Imran that we find, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a testimony that none has the right to be worshipped except for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise the angels and then people, men and women of knowledge of understanding who have that understanding that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped. Thus we find that as many people begin to talk about various topics and various themes, the essence of the believer is to go back to belief. That is the beginning and the end of the believer. And unfortunately for some of us, our life has become, and it should be highlighted because some of us have only become tarnished with certain tertiary elements. Raful yadain fi salah, tahriq al isba' fi tashahud, ta'min khalf al imam, saying ameen behind the imam. Raising one's hands inside the salah, moving one's finger inside the prayer, al wadu yadain al sadr, placing one's hands on the chest, etc. All of these are beautiful and good things. Based upon the hadith in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, Sallu kama ra'aytu muni usalli. Praise you've seen me praying. Walakin idha wahid yukhalif sunnah, a person goes against his sunnah, doesn't practice this. Fahal salatu sahiha. Is that person's prayer sahih according to sharia? Is it maqbula in the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, it is. None of the fuqah have concluded a person who doesn't place their hand on the chest or doesn't say ameen or doesn't raise their hands. Is their prayer invalidated? None of the fuqah have made that statement. That is an extreme element among some of our people inside our community who begin to highlight and say a person who doesn't offer and pray in this manner فَصَلَاتُهُ batila. That person's prayer is invalidated. This is no'un min al-jahl. This is an element of ignorance existing any amongst us. None of the fuqaha have ever concluded that. And some of us, that only becomes a symbol of da'wah, that we begin to call towards these points. The da'wah of Ahlul Tawheed, the da'wah of Ahlul Sunnah, is the da'wah of Tawheed. That is the symbol that we should be returning people back to. And then these secondary and tertiary issues, it become easy for people to develop and to focus upon their lives. But as for many of us, that becomes our main theme. And as you can see amongst our community, people are growing up, don't make a distinction between Tawheed and Shirk. That people, their element of Tawakkal, reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is weakening. 
in our community still we find to this day in a modern day world people coming to graves to shrines to salihin to relying upon threads and etc that we find these are all dangerous elements which are corroding and taking away the essence of the orthodox views towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's when people talk about so many different elements we need to return people back to the foundation even when people talk about high elements of sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many people in their zeal and their passion don't know hardly anything of the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's we need to go back to the basics walakin kunu rabbaniyin bima kuntum ta'allimun al-kitab wa bima kuntum tadrusun become rabbaniyin become good teachers teaching people the most beneficial things inside their life that's why ma ruya ani ibn abbas radiyallahu anhuma that which has been attributed to ibn abbas what does it mean to be rabbaniyin teaching the people the smaller knowledge before the greater knowledge the knowledge that concerns them on a daily basis in their lives that's what a muslim should be teaching the people in the community around them taking them away from the kufr from the disbelief towards iman towards the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you find throughout the Quran the Quran is always focusing upon every single ayah or every other ayah in some form or some pattern is reminding the believing believer about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so many different derivatives of the Quran law kanu ya'qilun tafhamun tadhakkarun yafqahun ta'lamun if all they could ponder reflect understand comprehend if they can have the intellect yatadhakkarun reflect regarding this all these ayat inside the Quran for what purpose to remind the individual of submitting towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out ayatul kawniya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out certain signs in the heavens and the earth to make the individual to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example towards the end of surah al imran that we find in fi khalqi samawati wal ard wa ikhtilaf al layl wal nahar la ayat li ulil albab alladhina those individuals who see the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi khalqi samawati wal ard see the creation of the heavens and the earth the alternation night and the day as signs for men of understanding alladhina yadhkuruna Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkaruna fi khalqi samawati wal ard rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila subhanaka faqina adhab an-nar the believers of those individuals see the alternation of the night and the day they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing bowing prostrating and they say rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila our lord you have not created this without any purpose there must be a purpose of the creation of the heavens and the earth and that purpose is to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise the quran mentions sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al haqq we'll show them our signs all around the heavens and the earth and within their own selves that they begin to recognize and submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the quran even mentions wa fi anfusikum afala tubsirun even a structure of your own human body there are signs for you to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so here we're trying to highlight that everything around us pushes the individual to recognize allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to obey and to submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's this becomes the highest level of knowledge the person who recognizes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then begins to do what begins to submit begins to obey وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I do not create the jinn and the human being except for to worship me. Another recitation is Ibn Abbas attributed to him بِمَعْنَى لِيُوَحِّدُونَ To only serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the, the essence and the foundation of the human being. That is what we need to revive inside our lives and to stay away from the opposite. The opposite of Tawheed, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is we find the element of shirk is tainting our belief and having a corrupt belief that's the quran mentions towards the end of surah yusuf wama yu'minu aktharuhum billahi illa wa hum mushrikun most people believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but their, their creed their belief is tainted with shirk they are mushrikun now here as a side point we should be very vigilant because some of us would like to quote this verse and obviously other people begin to think that we're calling them mushrikun abadan that's the first lesson we should stop upon to call another Muslim a mushrik is something thaqil it's something very, very heavy it's like saying to another Muslim anta kafir, you're a disbeliever so when we quote these ayat our intent is not to say so and so Muslim is a mushrik qad yakun amaluhu shirkiya maybe that person's action is action of shirk as Ibn Taymiyyah mentions rahmatullah alayhi a person does an action of kufr fala tahkum alayhi annahu kafir 
person does an action of kufr, don't say that person is now a kafir, a disbeliever. And that's where some of us, we get it wrong. We see a person doing action of shirk, we say, fahuwa mushrik. Person does an action of kufr, we say, fahuwa kafir. La, abadan, never in your lives. Never do that in your lives. Not for the awam, it's not for the general masses to take certain ayat and certain principles of hadith and say, this person is a mushrik, this person is a kafir, this person is like that. La. كل مسلم المسلم حرام دمه وماله وعرضه. Everything a Muslim is sanctified is to be respected. Their blood, their property, and their honor and their dignity. It's not for us, for the awam, the general people, to go around and say this person he done this. He's a disbeliever. He's a mushrik. But the person's action could be action of shirk. The person's action could be action of kufr. That's it. As for to go a step beyond that and to be flamboyant and open and say these people are mushrikun, these people are like this, look, that's not for us to do. So in the Quran, we quote this ayah in the Quran that most people believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but their belief is tainted with shirk, is corruption, it's a strong warning towards these individuals, especially if they happen to be Muslims, to begin to reconcile, to begin to think about their life, about the type of actions that they are doing. And as we know that shirk is the greatest sin. There's many sins which have been described inside the Quran, inside the hadith that we find. That's why Imam al dhahabi in his famous book, Al-Kaba'ir, a book talking about the major sins whereby he collects some 80, 90 different sins. And then he begins to mention, dissect what are the signs, the symbols of what is classified as min al-Kaba'ir from amongst the major sins. Is that whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned adab, mentioned punishment, chastisement, torture, going into Jahannam, being punished like this. Or oh, this is supposed to be punishment, hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established upon this earth. That is how a person recognizes what is the, a major sin. So we find min al-kaba'ir. From amongst the major sins that we find is al-ishraku billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amongst the major sins. In a hadith we find ijtanibu sab al mubiqat. Stay away from the seven abominable destructive sins. The sins that destroy the individual. Amongst them we find awwalan is a shirk billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the thing that destroys everything of the individual. Hatta the Quran mentions, even warning the Prophet Muhammad La in ashrakta, if you was to commit shirk, and this is mustahil, the messenger and none of the messengers will ever commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you was to commit shirk, la yahbatanna amaluk, then we will cut off your actions. That even your actions, Ya Rasulullah, will become null and void. It's a severe warning. That's how dangerous shirk is. It wipes away all of the actions of the individual. Likewise, that Surah Furqan that we find, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We bring the actions of these individuals, these disbelieving individuals, mountains of good deeds that they do, but we make it into what? هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا Like scattered dust, ashes. Their actions have no value at all. Why? Because their actions are covered with shirk. Disbelief and kufr towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find that shirk is a dangerous sin. That's why Luqman alayhi salam, he warned his son, Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Luqman said to his son, advising his son, if you find the legacy surah Luqman, the 31st chapter of the Quran, all the actions he tells his son to stay away from. Wa ala ra'sim, right at the beginning, he gives this mawidah, the strong admonition to his son. He says to him, Ya Bunayya, O my beloved son, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. The greatest oppression you can ever commit is to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we find in ma'ani of zulm is wad'u shay fi ghayri makanihi. From the meaning of zulm is to place something in other than its right place. That's the opposite is al-hikmah, wisdom, is to place something wad'u shay fi makanihi. Wisdom is to place something in the right place. Zulm is to place something in an incorrect place. So ibadah belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You give it to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this becomes dhulm. It becomes oppression. And that's the greatest oppression the person commits upon oneself is to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Quran mentions, الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمَنْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Those individuals who never ever commit any dhulm upon their own selves. Those are the successful individuals, those in the people in a state of tranquility and peace. So some of the companions, they pose the question that who amongst us doesn't commit a dhulm? Because dhulm, as we all know, carries the meaning of oppression, of sinning, of ma'asiyah, disobedience. So the companions said that all of us, we commit a dhulm. We all oppress, we all sin, we make mistakes. 
So what is the meaning of this ayah? Those who don't commit any form of zulm. So the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, he described يفسر الآية he explained the ayah, the meaning of zulm في هذه الآية بمعنى is إن الشرك لظلم عظيم the greatest zulm oppression is to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like we saw in other hadith where you find الإشراك بالله سبحانه وتعالى greatest sin is shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أن تجعل لله ندا وهو خلقك to make a nid, a sharik, a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the one that created you and that is we're going to mention all different forms of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still exist unfortunately inside that society inside the Quran you find two identical verses inside the Quran inside Surah An-Nisa the ending is slightly different إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive every single sin every single sin will be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for shirk that's how dangerous it is so a person for argument's sake may commit haram, may steal, may cheat, may lie, commit zina, drink alcohol, take drugs, whatever it may be يَعْرِفْ أَنَّهُ مَعْصِيَةً knows this is a sin but a person doesn't associate any partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's more chances of this individual it doesn't mean this person is definitely <coughs> going to be forgiven and goes to paradise as some of us we think I've got the right tawheed so if I commit disbelief I do something haram I won't be punished La, abadan. that's another warning to some of us Muslims we think because I've got the right creed I won't be punished who said that? there's no proof of that the right creed only means there's more chances of the person being forgiven there's more chances of the person entering into paradise but if a person has committed sins and vices on that journey there's no guarantee that you won't be punished Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes whomever he wants and he forgives whomever he wants subhanahu wa ta'ala that is sunnat Allah inside the heavens that will be subhanahu wa ta'ala so some of us become too reliant we think because I have the right creed I have the right belief then somehow I don't need to pay attention to how I conduct and how I carry out my life or what I need to do inside my life that's another extreme element among some of us that person should be worried that yes I may have discovered the right creeds and right belief now am I making that effort? am I exerting myself and trying my best to become amongst those individuals? because the whole journey is to find the swiftest and the quickest path and the quickest entry into paradise that's what the journey of the Muslim is so even when we begin to discuss about people who deviate, who go away from the path, who've gone astray, or we don't agree with them, our intent isn't, as some of us we think, to have a go at them. Our intent isn't to belittle them. Our intent is not to be derogatory towards them. Our intent is not to question them. Our intent is to help ourselves and them to find what? The path to paradise. This is the one path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow that path. Do not follow the other paths. The other paths, those are the paths who take you astray. This is the advice, the legacy that's been given to this Muslim Ummah. They may become pious individuals. Read the tafsir of this ayah, you find the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, that you find that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he drew a long line in the sand. He said, This is the long path to paradise. These are the paths that you find on the side of the right and the left. At the end of each of these paths is nothing but the shaitan, the devil that's waiting there. The path to Jannah is a long path. It's a long journey. There is no real shortcut to paradise. It's a long struggle and devotion and commitment to get to the end path. So we're trying to find that long path, but it can be made quick and made swift if we encourage one another to find that path, to discover that path and to work upon that path. And that's what our attempt becomes. The people that we love, the people that are close to us, the people in our community, we're trying to bring them closer to that path, that together we rejoice in this dunya, and more so together inside the hereafter, that we return back to be inside the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's you find inside Surah Al-Hajj as well. In man yushrik billah, before they find whoever commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is as if that individual, فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْتَفُهُ الطَّيْرِ أو تحوي به ريح في مكان سحيق. In Surah Al-Hajj, the twenty-second chapter of the Quran, that we find the person who commits shirk with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is as if that person كأنما خر من السماء. Is as if that person is falling from the heavens, falling from the sky, or the bird snatches him, 
or the wind takes him away to a far away place. What is the meaning of this ayah? What is the interpretation that this ayah is trying to highlight? As the ulama of tafsir mentioned, a shirk la yuqarribuka ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shirk will never bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shirk drifts you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if you're falling from the heavens and a bird snatches you or the wind blows you away fi makanin sahiq to a far away place. So shirk doesn't bring you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the Quran. It documents those people they mention. Ma na'buduhum illa li yuqarribuna ila Allahi zulfa. We only worship these deities. We only worship these intermediaries to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, that's exactly the same response that some Muslims give today. We only use these individuals to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran mentions inside the beginning of Surah Al-A'raf, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم بربكم ولا تتبعوا من دون الله أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون. It says, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم بربكم. Follow that which has been sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't follow other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the awliya. These people, whether they're righteous people, pious people, good people, whatever it may be, don't follow. Whether it be even your own imam, your own uh, imam, mashaykh, whoever it may be. If it goes against the Quran and the sunnah, there's no obedience. Qalila ma tadhakkaroon. Little it is that you ponder and you reflect. So Islam is telling us to follow the right path, the straight path, directly. Even it warns that even to take the messenger as an intermediary is not allowed. To say that you take him as an intermediary, get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not allowed in the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus you find the greatest ayah inside the Quran after وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned call upon me and I'll respond to your supplications. The greatest ayah inside the Quran is inside the ayat which talk about the fiqh of Ramadan. Some verse 183, 184 of, of Surah Al-Baqarah. If you go and read that long page and flip over the page, you find the most powerful ayah inside the Quran. In that fiqh of Ramadan, it talks about the fiqh of Siyam, person who's fasting, person who's traveling, and Shahrul Ramadan, Alladhi Unzila Fi Al-Quran. The Quran is the month, Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Ila akhir ayat, till eventually you come to which ayah? Wa idha sa'laka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِي إِذَا دَعَانْ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ If the servant asks about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ Look at the response of the Qur'an. The Qur'an says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ I am close by. The Qur'an does not say, if you're a good Muslim, you're a bad Muslim, you're a sinful Muslim, you're this type of Muslim. The Qur'an says, if you call, if the servant asks about me, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I'm close by. And if you study manhaj al-Qur'an, if you study the science and the methodology of the Qur'an, you find whenever someone poses a question inside the Qur'an, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ They ask you about gambling and alcohol. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيضِ They ask you about the menstrual cycle. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ They ask you about the crescent. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ They ask you about the soul. So many different questions are asked inside the Qur'an. If you go and look at these questions, and then you look at the answers. The answers are given in the Arabic language, in Fi'l Amr, in the imperative verb, Qul, say. So, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ Say the answer to about alcohol and gambling is inside them, these two sins, there's a ithm, there's a sin. And there's some benefit. وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَقْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْئِهِمَا But their harm is more dangerous than their benefit. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيدِ They ask you about the woman's menstrual cycle. قُلْ هُوَ أَذَى Say there's harm inside that for the woman. They ask you about يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّةِ They ask you about the crescent. Crescent. قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ The moving of the crescent, the shape of the crescent is مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ لِلْمَوْسِمِ الْحَجِّ for hajj and the other moms and, and salawat and the prayers etc. They ask you about the soul. Say the knowledge belongs with only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's throughout the Qur'an. قُلْ يَا أَيُّ الْكَافِرُونَ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ That's مِنْ مَعَانِي of قُلْ That you, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ لَهُمْ Say to them. Give this response to them. This is the one place inside the Qur'an. The one place inside the Qur'an where the question is posed. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي If the servant asks about me, 
The Quran here doesn't say فَقُلْ inni qareeb. It doesn't say you say O Messenger to the people that I am close by. It doesn't say that. Have you ever thought about that? Why doesn't it say that? It's plausible to say that because people may come along and say but look the Messenger is saying I am close by. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eliminates that. And thus you find the Sharia ah, anything that leads to shirk anything that leads to disobedience is removed. There are no wasail, there's no turuq, there's no space that is given to a person to think, well, maybe we allow this. The sharia ah straight away cramps upon it. So when the sharia ah was being sent down, you find that visiting the graves was forbidden. When the sharia ah was being sent down, visiting the graves was forbidden. When the sharia ah was complete towards the end of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, he then allowed people to go and visit the graves. It reminds you about death. But in between, if you go and study it, Indeed, I forbade you from visiting the graves. For what purpose? Go and read the purpose, the intent. Because some people may begin to do what? Begin to worship the graves. That's why you find that some ulama mentioned, even when you go to the graves, that you should be wary not to raise your hands at times. Because somebody may think what? Some jahil person may think, you are making dua not for the dead, you're making dua to the dead. Look how accurate the Sharia ah is. We may not pay too much attention to this because some ignorant individual may think, I saw so and so standing there raising his hands. So I think now it's allowed for me to pray who? To the dead. So the Sharia ah stops all of this. It prevents all of this. Anything that leads to kufr and shirk needs to be prevented. So when people say that, oh, they stop the graves, they prevent people from coming from the graves then why shouldn't we stop people from coming fr to the graves? We're not against the Salihin, righteous people. Their legacy remains behind. Their legacy of their actions remain behind. We follow those actions. Picking up the crumbs and the stones and the rocks and putting them inside our pockets and thinking this is a form of tabarruk and blessing that we find. What did the Prophet Muhammad say to Ali towards the end of his life? He said to Ali, any grave you find more than a hand span any grave more than a hand span, what should you do? You should demolish it. Our graves are how high at the moment? Isn't it? How high are they at the moment? He advised Ali, any grave you find beyond that level, desecrate it, destroy it, dismantle it, take it away. Who's going against the teachings of the Sunnah today? Who's going against the teachings? The final words, his advice is that destroy graves that go beyond that limit. That's it, simple life. Simple, a Muslim is so simple, a simple individual, that's it. Today that we find shrines and whatever it may be and people say, well, this is not really shirk, this is just a way of remembering them and a way of showing love and respect towards them. Love and respect is shown via obedience. That's why the Arab poet, he wrote the lines of poetry, لَوْ كَانَ حُبُّكَ صَادِقًا لَأَطَعْبُهُ إِنَّ الْمُحِبَّ لِمَنْ يُحِبُّ مُطِيعُهُ If your love was truthful, lovers obey the one that they love. You love the messenger, you obey him. You claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make ittiba' rasul follow the Prophet Muhammad So he gave us these teachings. Either he did not give us the teachings or he did give the teachings. So amongst his final words are, avoid this. Stay away from this. Don't do this action. He warned his people and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, don't let my grave become a point of Eid. Where people, because Eid bi min ma'ani of Eid is Ada Ya'udu, what comes again against so Eid al Fitr, Eid al Adha, it comes again and again. So don't let my, let my grave become a place of Eid and a place of worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected his grave. Has protected his grave. And that's you find the Quran mentions that Surah Al Ma'id as well. Ya ayyur Rasul, ballik ma'unzila ilayka min rabbik. O Messenger, convey to the people of the message that's been given to you. If you do not convey the message, then you have not fulfilled that trust. Then you know this ayah concludes in a very strange way, because obviously some of us we don't reflect too much deep into the Quran. The ayah concludes by mentioning, Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas Allah will protect you from the people. Allah will protect who? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that mentioned beginning of Surah Al-Isra, Subhan alladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Blessed be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his beloved servant from Masjid al-Haram, 
from the Kaaba all the way to Masjid al-Aqsa and then from where all the way to the heavens Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pr protect the Prophet Muhammad he needs no individual to protect him that's what you find in the hadith in Bukhari whoever lies lying is, is a sin but lying upon me is far more severe and whoever intentionally lies regarding me <coughs> let that individual take his seat in the hellfire مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever intentionally lies about me, let him take his seat in the hellfire. You know what some people they say in their zeal and their passion? لَا نُكَذِّبْ عَلَيْهِ نُكَذِّبْ لَهُ We don't lie against him, we lie for him to protect him. انظر إلى هذا الجهل we lie to protect the Prophet Muhammad So Many of them they even admit what they're narrating is a lie. It's not even a hadith which is weak. <coughs> it's something which is classified as a clear lie, fabrication. But they say we know, but we're trying to encourage people. It's a way of showing honor and dignity towards the Prophet Muhammad You can't use falsehood. You can't use kufr. You can't use shirk to bring people closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should be crystal clear. The only thing that will bring close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the pure, pristine ayat of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Likewise, as Surah Al-Ma'idah that we find, one of the most conclusive ayat inside the Qur'an, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَأْوَاهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it haram for that person to ever go into paradise. This da'wah isn't da'wah of Ahlul Hadith or da'wah Salafi or da'wah Wahhabiyya or da'wah Najdiyya or da'wah of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is a da'wah of what? Of the Qur'an. Surah Al-Ma'idah. Innahu may yushrik billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, whoever commits shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah is saying, whoever dies upon shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it haram for that person to ever go where? Into paradise. That person's ending abode will be the fire and that person will have no helpers. People try to make ta'wil of this ayah, they try to make tafsir of this ayah or reinterpret this ayah saying this ayah is like Surah Al-Ma'idah yet tahadith anil nasara. This ayah is talking about the Christians. No, that's not true. There's a principle inside usul al-tafsir that you find al-ibra bi umum al-lafzi la bi khususi sabab. The lesson is to be taken from the generality of the words and not from the specifics of revelation. So in the Quran, throughout the Quran is talking about whom? Bani Israel. Isn't it? Does that mean now we just sit there and ignore it? All these ayat we heard inside Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa, and Al-Ma'idah, Al-An'am, Al-Anfal, and Al-A'raf that we find. Do we sit there thinking, you know, these ayat don't concern me? Most of this Quran, يَقُصُّ ala Bani Israel. Moses' Qur'an is narrating about Bani Israel. You know for what intent? Because most of us are going to do exactly the same mistakes as Bani Israel. That's why most of you know many of us Muslims, we don't seem to understand the Qur'an is, is talking to us. So many of us when we read the ayat, Ya Bani Israel, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, we begin to think, you know what? That's not me. That's got nothing to do with me. When the Qur'an says the Sufaha, the foolish ones, the Qur'an begins to talk about the Sufaha, the foolish individual. We sit there thinking, you know what? It's got nothing to do with us. You fail to understand the language of the Quran. The Quran is talking to us foolish individuals. That's what the Quran is. It's, it's addressing us because we are the foolish individuals. If you assess these ayat today, you assess the context. We are the foolish individuals. So the Quran is addressing us time and time again. It's addressing us. They don't make the mistakes of those individuals. That's when the Quran when it talks about the people of Sabt. We begin to think, oh, look at these individuals, look how foolish they were. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade them from fishing on a Saturday, and you find the fish, shurra'an, the fish were jumping up, okay? They were jumping out of the, the, the sea. They said, you know, what is this? It's haram for us to fish. We can't tolerate this. Let us go Friday night and throw our nets. So when the fish jump out, they jump out, they go into the net. Yeah, Allah, we're not fishing. Just like today. Oh, Sheikh, I'm not committing riba. It's on my son's name. It's on my next door neighbor's name. 
I'm not selling alcohol. The people, they work there. It's just our business. They're doing it. I'm not doing anything wrong. The next door people are doing it. It's their properties on their name. Trying to find what? Deception. Trying to trick Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we Muslims become. We say, oh, we're not like them. If you look at us in great detail, our actions are exactly like those individuals. We know something's haram. We know akl riba is haram. If a person says, I know it's haram, but it's a weakness, no problem. Person, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps him come out of it. But we try to make excuses. We try to find a leeway and say, you know, but, you know, it's something good, it's uh, beneficial, it helps the children, it helps the family, it helps the community. What is this? Just conclude it's haram. And even if you do it, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you, pardon you, and bring you out of it. So we fall into a trap of becoming like those individuals. These are our tests, and we begin to find excuses. We try to justify the things that we are doing. That's the Quran mentions those individuals. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَصَيْنَا We hear and we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believers of those individuals. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. That's what a Muslim should be. We hear and we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So going back to the ayat of Surah Al-Ma'idah that we find, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a severe warning, a stern warning, that if you die upon shirk, then this is something very, very dangerous. We should be worried about this, worried about ourselves, worried about our children, worried about our family members, that they're doing these actions, that how can we turn it aside? How can we just turn a blind eye? And likewise, on a mass scale, a mass portion is Muslim Ummah Fasiru Fil Ard. Yes, the world has developed, the world has gone, gone forward. But if you look at our community around us, what do you find them doing? You find them clearly practicing and doing actions of shirk. And we don't even think. We don't even think. And it doesn't upset us anymore, some of us, unfortunately. You know, the Quran mentions the heavens and the earth are about to rip open. And da'u li rahmani walada. That these people attributed a son to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, some of these people, what do they attribute to the people yani, around them? If you read what they attribute towards them, these people, they've been given a destination to go into paradise and they can pick and choose people who will go into paradise with them and save them and rescue them. All of this negates one ta one's tawheed, one's belief regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus you find the ulama have collected three elements of tawheed, three elements of belief towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed al rububiyyah the belief in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala lahul khalqu wal amr indeed that the command and the creation belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rabbul alamin bima'na there's no english word for it he is the nourisher the provider the one who takes care and looks after everything upon this earth and thus you find that it's quite strange that the quraysh they recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the rabb if you to ask them man khalaqa samawati wal ard and you said to them, who created the heavens and earth? لا يقولون الله They say Allah. They would say that, they recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that created the heavens and earth. Who sends down the rain? They say Allah. But when it came to the ibadah, that's where they began to commit shirk. You find that some Muslims today, they begin to believe that the heavens and the earth are controlled by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you study the element of qutub, that's you find that qutub is the people, their pivots. They are awliya who come to a certain station. They travel on a certain journey and they become, they become promoted to come in certain positions. And they begin to see the heavens and the earth around them. Tasawwaru hadha. Hadha aynu shirk. How is it possible that a human being comes to such a level, is able to visualize the heavens and the earth? Or people begin to think that the people, these people can respond to us and to help us. The Quran throughout. Highlights, the teachings are clearly highlighted there. These people inside their graves, inside their locations, they are more in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than us. They are in need of us in terms of we come and we visit and make dua and supplication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expand their grave and forgive their sins and to pardon them and to, and to protect them. But some of us are going to the other extreme. We think because they're righteous, there must be some element of barakah around them inside their lives, even of this modern world. That's why some of us, our da'wah has no impact around the people. They think it's, it's culturalism. You know, look how much our, our impact of da'wah amongst the non-Muslims. We tell them the, these fables, these myths and these stories. And you know, I was standing next to a grave and the, the righteous man's hand came out the grave and he shook me and he gave me this, he done this. And you think it attracts non-Muslims? They think, what's this person talking about? What are these superstitious beliefs? Or I got this thread tied next to my car 
it gives me blessings. Our Ayatul Kursi, you know, I, I didn't keep it in my pocket today. That's why, you know, this happened to me. Inshallah. That's what our people have become, isn't it? And that's why even ulama mentioned, even writing the Quran, yes, there might, might be barakah. But this f form of understanding of the, of the Quran, it needs to be removed from our society. People wearing ta'weed, amulet, and saying this, this protects me from doing haram, takes away evil from me. But it takes away no, no, no haram away from me. You're doing every single haram on the face of the earth, isn't it? And oh, the ta'weed, it protects me. Yeah, akhi, what is this? And ta'mal bil Quran. Yani, don't you act, act by the Quran. Yani, we sent down this book, yani, uh, 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 we sent down a blessed book. Mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. A blessed book that we sent down, liyaddabbaru ayatihi. Ibn, uh, uh, Ibn Imam al-Ahsan al-Basri mentions, liyaddabbaru ayati bi ma'na, yani li an ta'mala bil Quran. You reflect over the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you begin to implement the Quran. That's in a hadith in Bukhari you find of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha asked about the character and the behavior of the Prophet Muhammad he mentioned kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an his character was the Qur'an what does it mean his character was the Qur'an? that everything halal and haram he implemented everything haram he stayed away from it that's it became the walking talking Qur'an the living embodiment of the Qur'an is what the Prophet Muhammad was and that's what we need to become once again the living embodiment so that's you find the first lesson is Tawheed al rububiyyah study the Quran about talking about the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator. Anything that negates that is an element of shirk. Thus you find that reading of philosophy and study of philosophy that you find that some Muslims begin to read and they begin to study that. And you know, there, there is no existence, there is no God, God doesn't exist. As you find some Muslims, what does their life become? Life has come, become pomp and play and amusement and time will just destroy us. That's why even amongst our own Muslims, what do you find? That's why people don't have that creed, don't have that yaqeen, don't have that certainty, don't have that iman. So iman for them is something far away. Quran begins by mentioning the believers of those individuals muttaqoon alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaybi who believe in the unseen. The whole Quran is a journey of the unseen. The more you believe in the unseen, the more stronger your actions become towards the unseen. You have that vision, the unseen, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you become weary. It creates targheeb al nas it makes you become worried to do actions to get to the akhirah. Not like some of us, oh I believe, you know my father's the imam of the masjid, you know my sister wears hijab, my brother went to Darul Uloom, you know, my young son's reading Quran, that's it, that's me. You know, I'm Ahlul Hadith, that's it, finish. La ishada. Ma you feed. Doesn't benefit you in any way. You have life, Allah taziru wa wizra ukhra. No individual will carry the sins of another individual. All of us will come in their judgment, farda. All in our own, responsible for our own selves. If you have subjects underneath you, ya ayyul ladina amanu, qu anfusakum ahlikum nara. It is people, you have subjects underneath you, save yourselves and save your family members from the hellfire. By teaching them that which is right, the most important element being the belief, and then after that teach them to live a life of showing that belief, showing that devotion that you really believe by carrying out the actions that show that you are compliant in your submission towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a person has that weak conviction, then their actions become weak. And thus you find that the essence is to go back and to read about the belief regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most beneficial hadith a person can read. And the various explanations is the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. If a person can go back and read the various explanations, understand this one hadith, then that person inshallah will be successful throughout their life. Just one hadith. Just read that one hadith and all of its various interpretations but different ulama that you find. It will benefit you for the rest of your life. Because at the end of the hadith it mentions, إِنَّهُ جِبْرَائِيلَ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ Indeed that was Jibreel alayhi salam who came to teach you your deen. So you understand what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan, you will be successful throughout your life. The second element of Tawheed that we find is Tawheed al-Ibadah, al-Uluhiyya, to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ La sharika lahu wa bidhalika umirtu wa ana awalul muslimin Say my prayer, my sacrifice, my living, my dying is all dedicated to whom? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Associate no partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So that's, that becomes 
the element level of ibadah that we find. The whole of life of the believer is based upon ibadah. Even when a person sleeps, it becomes ibadah. To wake yourself up in the morning for Salatul Fajr, to fend for your family, to take care of your children. person sleeps with that intent, it becomes ibadah. Yeah, hatta even a person goes to the toilet, to the lavatory, matrimonial relationship, all becomes ibadah of the individual if they are focused and thinking and reflecting towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thus you find the person spends their whole life in purifying their actions to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following the sunnah and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And once again today we find Tawheed al-Ibadah, what we find inside our community. We find people taking vows in other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People sacrificing in other than the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of people who remove the jinn etc that you find, what do they tell people to do? Go and listen and study carefully. And people say, this person removes the jinn, the person does that. Because many times these people go and say, go and sacrifice the name of so-and-so. Go and sacrifice at so-and-so grave, so the jinn leaves. The jinn leaves because you know why? You've committed the ultimate sin, you committed shirk. The jinn laughs and walks away. That's the intent of the shayateen or jinn, wal ins. That is the intent of the devil. The highest level of sin that he wants to commit is for you to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the most important thing he wants to gain. Then it comes below and below and below that. So objective is met. People begin to say, oh look, this person removes the jinn. They don't go and see the essence. They don't see the essence. Nobody wants to go the long way of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praying, fasting, coming to the masjid, reading the Quran, implementing these things. For some of these people, it's far easier to pay 500 pounds to someone and say, look, go and sacrifice, go and do this, and let me re relieve me from this problem. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see who amongst his servants are truly dedicated, who are truly focused and only People, Ahlul Taqwa, wa Ahlul Iman, will recognize that even in their masaib, even in difficulties, there is a blessing. People of Tawheed, they recognize even in difficulties, there's still a blessing. That this is a door for me to become more vigilant towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People of shirk and innovation for them, it becomes a fitna, a trial for them. They try to find ways out via these evil paths. So even today that we find, unfortunately, people will come and sacrifice on these graves and these shrines in other name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you should warn our people and warn our parents and people around us to stay any away from this, this level of, 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 of shirk that we find inside our society. The third most important element of tawheed that we find is to call and to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa lil asma'ul husna fad'u biha to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful names and attributes. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these beautiful names and attributes. That's what ulama mentioned. You use the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make dua ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not like today, people sing them and chant them Allah, 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 singing songs with guitar and music and the name Allah flicking around in the background and saying Allah, Allah, Allah. What is this? This is ilhad. Ulama mentions ilhad. This is disrespect to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chanting the names, singing the names. So from Allah it becomes who and then this becomes blowing through the nose and it comes going into hallucination, going into kashf, it comes into this. Did the Prophet Muhammad ever do that in his life? Did he ever do that in his life? Did his companions ever do that? Did he ever encourage his people to do that weird in that manner to sit there and say Allah, Allah, Allah? Or you find books are written today that say Ar-Razaq, Ar-Razaq, Ar-Razaq and money will be given to you. Al-Wajid, 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 say it a thousand times and whatever you lost will come back to you. Where? All these quotations, they're not even a hadith, they're mawdu'ad, they're fabricated. These little books that you find, say this name of Allah, say this 1,000 times, say this this many times, you can say it 10,000 times if you want. There's, there's no essence to it. There's no essence to it. The way that you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the appropriate manner. That in, in, inside your salah, inside your dua, you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his beautiful names and attributes, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Accepting your, your deficiency, your mistakes inside your life, humbling yourself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see those individuals. That you find that when an individual, when they submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every individual has an element of some form of arrogance or pride or ego within themselves. But Islam is what re removes that and that's the person when they submit in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bow your head down only in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we find inside our society? The sheikh comes, the imam comes, people bowing down and putting their hands like this. You, you, you Hindus? 
huh? putting your hands down like this, yani, you're, fa- you're faqir. Man huwa, huwa rajul, ya ayyun nas. He's a human being. He's a human being. Mumkin give him respect for certain elements, that's about it. But not to turn your back when you walk away from him. You know, and these type of elements, what is this? Person should avoid all of this. Avoid these acres of behavior. They are all bashar. None of us know. فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Don't claim sanctity and piety for yourself. Allah knows best. Some of us and some of those people, we could be the first ones inside Jahannam, may Allah forbid. We could be the first ones inside Jahannam thinking that we are special people. No one is special in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah knows who are the real special people. That's it. So we need to remove these elements of the way that, and, and, and the alqab and the names and the attributes you give to the people yani, around us. It's all dangerous. All this leads to elements of shirk and taking us away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالزُّبُرْ Ask the people of knowledge and understanding. بِأَيِّ مَعْنَى Explaining the Qur'an, the hadith, that's it. Other than that, there should, should not be anything else inside our lives. And this will all help us to come back to the pristine way. And this will also attract the non-Muslims around us when they begin to see that our life is an orthodox creed of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will attract them. I remember years ago when I was inside Pakistan, inside one of the masjids, and there you find very rarely non-Muslims, they come in inside that environment. So one day we came into the masjid, Salat al-Isha, if I'm not mistaken, we were slightly delayed. We came into the masjid, one individual was inside the masjid. And obviously we found it very strange, because everyone's rushing to catch the jama'ah, and this person is looking around. So we thought, you know, what is this? It's not like here you can expect it might be a non-Muslim. We thought, who is this person looking around? Why is he looking around in this manner? So maybe try to harm the Muslims, try to harm or do something. So then we started to pray, and everybody was coming and saying, look, yalla, 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 namaz time, namaz paro. So everyone's calling him. So as we began the prayer, so eventually he joined in the prayer. When we got up to complete the prayer, because we missed one or two raka'at, we stood up to pray. He just sat there and he gave his salam, he copied everyone. So from there, we understood, you know, there's something strange. Either this person doesn't know how to pray, which is very strange in a remote place inside a Muslim country. He doesn't know how to pray. Or well, he must be a non-Muslim. There must be something strange about this individual. <coughs> so anyhow, after the prayer, we approached him and asked him, you know, how comes you in the mercy? What's your situation? He goes, I'm not a Muslim. You know, I'm Italian. I come from Italy. You know, and I just happened to come into the masjid. And I looked at the masjid and looked at the environment. And he said that, you know, you people have a very strong relationship with God. Because those of you know, in, in Catholicism, they have a lot of statues and idols, etc. that they have. He says, a very simple belief. And the way that you prayed was very unique. And the way that you were devoting yourself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards God, was very special. And he was weeping, he was crying. I was thinking in my heart that how many of us who just read Salah or read Namaz were thinking about Allah? He's looking from outside and he's impressed. But how many of us were really focusing inside our prayers? Imagine that, that the simple progress of the prayer, process of the prayer, it attracted him towards Al-Islam. Now imagine if we became individuals who understood the belief and the orthodox views of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Tawheed and we began to teach these people and to rectify them. Don't you think they'll be attracted towards Al-Islam? Don't you think there'll be a lot more of them with a better understanding of Islam in coming towards Islam? Did not the Prophet Muhammad send Mu'adh bin Jabal to Al Yemen, send Ali to Al Yemen, send them to the people, send Hudayfa, send a single person? He said, You are coming to a people of Ahlul Kitab, a people of the book. That the first thing that you call them to is what? What do we call them to? Eid Miladun Nabi, Samosa, Biryani, Pakora, Sari, huh? Rasam Rawaj, Tangra, dancing. Festiv- festivities, isn't it? That's what we call them too, isn't it? So they don't know. You know, after so many years of working in different Islamic schools, you ask the people, ask a non-Muslim, you don't be surprised. Even the non-Muslim said, um, what's a Muslim? Oh, the guys who wear that big turban. Oh, the women who got the red dot and the sari on. Don't be surprised. That's what they'll give the response. Even after everything has taken place in front of their eyes, they don't know. They don't know any better. And we haven't helped the situation. 
So if you go back, he told these people, when you go to the people, that the first thing you call these people to is what? The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they accept that, then tell them about the prayer. If they accept that, then tell them about the zakah. So our role, many of our, we know many of our youth, look at our people, it's just a cultural understanding. There's no real understanding of what Islam is, and what needs to be delivered to the people you need around us. So we need to go back, strengthen our own iman, our own certainty, our own relationship to Tawheed, the importance of Tawheed, begin to live that and begin to implement that inside our lives. That will, inshallah, the least that will begin to happen is begin to attract other individuals to begin to ask and begin to question and begin to attract them and then begin to help to disseminate and to teach those individuals. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all amongst those people, Ahlul Tawheed, to live upon that, to die upon that, and to be resurrected upon that and to return back to be with the people ahlu tawheed wa ala ra'sihim none other than the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa li jami'il muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafurur rahim